I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Sari Scheinfeld. I'm an MA student at the Emil A. and Jenny Fish Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Yeshiva University. We are proud to welcome you to the fourth installment of our series, What is the Holocaust Today? This monthly series is a multidisciplinary exploration of the Shoah's ever-changing and everlasting impact on our lives and the world we live in. Each month, we'll feature a distinguished guest speaker who's leading and innovating in their field, reaching across multiple disciplines. I'd like to personally thank Dr. Shai Pilnick, Director of the Fish Center, Hodaya Blau, Center Coordinator, and the students at the Center who helped make this event possible. This episode, as well as our previous episodes, along with other archive content, will be available on our YouTube channel. I'd like to thank this month's co-sponsor, the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust in New York City. Before we begin, I'd just like to remind everybody that at the end of this session, we will have some time for Q&A. If you could post your questions in the chat, they'll be addressed as best we can at the end. I'd like to introduce this week's speaker, Mr. Yitzhak Mays. He'll be speaking about public history and the ever-evolving field of museology in his talk titled, Remembering the Holocaust in Museums. What are we remembering? Mr. Mays is a historian and museum professional with over 35 years of experience. His expertise in public history allows him to analyze large quantities of factual information and thereby identify and develop an engaging storyline, which highlights the major themes the exhibition will display. Mr. Mays was director of the Yad Vashem Historical Museum in Jerusalem from 1983 to 1995 and the founding chief curator of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust in New York. A distinguished public historian who has contributed to numerous scholarly and educational publications, he's consulted and developed museums and film projects on the Holocaust and Jewish history worldwide, including Jerusalem, Kiev, Montreal, Moscow, and New York. Some of his other projects include the Basketball Hall of Fame in Springfield, Massachusetts, and he served as curator with Michael Berenbaum to accompany the Pathbreaking Museum in Skokie, Illinois, which opened in April of 2009. Among the various projects, he's presently associated with the planned new museum, the House of Faith in Budapest, and a new museum planned for Salonika in Greece. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Itzik Mays. Fine, and I feel comfortable with Itzik. Uh, good evening. I'm gonna do something I've never done uh, right now, and uh, I'll beg your indulgence. Um, a very good friend of ours passed away with, and was buried today. So I'd like to make this lecture in her honor, Ilu uh, Nishama. Uh, so in the memory of Rebecca Levine Sprung, Ve Rebecca Rivka Bad Broga, Mayor Yaakov, who was an unusual person, fought cancer for five years, my wife's soulmate, and it's just too recent. I was just at the funeral uh, today. So I, this is in her honor and memory, and maybe they have a good ilui. Now, never done that before. So a little, excuse me. Anyway, the, the subject is remember the Holocaust. And the first question we have to, we have to ask is, and it's a question, is who, what are we remembering? Who are we remembering? Uh, and this is true not only for museums. It's also true for all levels of and different examples of public history, school curriculums, uh, novels, movies, etc. Okay. More often than not, and this is the, a, a major problem, and I'll explain why it's a problem. Uh, we talk about the Holocaust and present the Holocaust almost from a Nazi perspective. It's a Nazi narrative. And, uh, the Jews are there. They're objects, not, uh, not subjects. The main subjects are the Nazis. Who the Jews were, both their personalities before the war, the vitality of their communities, the vitality and the defi elements of defiance they showed during the war itself or during the Nazi regime, and especially the lessons that we learned from it are basically geared to minimize the Jewish aspect. And now, in a way, this is somewhat logical uh, and almost inevitable because the first encounter with the Holocaust as being presented either in novels, or much later in museums, was basically 
based on the research done for the Nuremberg trials right after the war. And that of course investigated the Nazi archives uh, and, and used Nazi photographs, images. There's no Jewish film by the way, but there are Jewish photographs, which I'll go into detail later. So what we basically, we're telling what the Nazis did, how many Jews were killed, where they were killed, how they were killed. We know the Jew as a victim. The Jew as a living entity is almost ignored, who had a life and a community beforehand, who had values, institutions, uh, uh, hopes for the future, et cetera, et cetera, hardly at all presented. So not only do, we, do, do the visitors, especially not, uh, think about non-Jewish visitors, this may be their first major encounter with Jews and Judaism. What do they know about Jews? Well, if you tell it from a Nazi perspective, all they know of the Jews, you'll see pictures of emaciated bodies, or you'll see a story told in which I've, a quote that I've often used is, it's the drama of Nazi, Jew, of Nazi butchery with the Jews as unidentified extras in a film. That's basically what it is. And this is across the board. Uh, most museums have this, and this is part of the what I've been working on and basically got the first opportunity to do it at Yad Vashem, uh, the exhibition I did with Michal Unger on the Ludge Ghetto. And then the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York actually broke new ground, made it very different than all other Holocaust museums that's showing the Jewish perspective. Now, when I say showing the Jewish perspective, it's not an either or. It's not only this, only that, only that. There are basically three levels, historical levels of dealing with the Holocaust. There's the perpetrators, those who carried out the actions and their collaborators. The Nazis could never have done it alone, okay? And I'm talking about collaboration on all levels. The Dutch civil service processed the Aryan forms to determine who was an Aryan and who wasn't for the Nazis. The French police, the gendarmerie, rounded up Jews that were ultimately deported, let alone in, Uk in Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania, et cetera, where volunteers often assisted or carried out on their own or assisted the Nazis in the physical murder of the Jews. So that the idea of the, the perpetrators, which is a very, is telling it from their point of view, how they developed the policy, what was their goal, what was their mission, is important. But is it the primary? And if it's the primary, what you then have is a situation where the Jews are faceless, the victims are faceless. And why, if it's my first encounter with Judaism, do I see the emaciated bodies of people who were liberated? Is that what Ju uh, who Jews and Judaism are? So that we have to be very careful about how we present it. And basically the percentages, again, you can't tell the story without the Nazis. Let's remember that we're talking about Jewish responses to the Holocaust. Response means the framework is created by somebody else. It's Nazi ideology which creates the framework, this racial ideology. It's not fascism per se, because Italy didn't follow suit. This is a fascist country. The need to always compare things to Nazi Germany and fascism uh, is, and use Germany as an example is very problematic because the minute you have discussion or an argument and you bring the Holocaust into it, the Holocaust is the essence of evil. Everyone knows that it's evil. And putting the Holocaust into the discussion makes it hysterical. Why can't you use fascist Italy, Mussolini as the cult of personality, etc.? In France, you have Action Francaise, a major movement, a, a fascist movement, Franco in Spain. To use the Holocaust is often in such discussions is often a misuse of the Holocaust. Because uh, the Holocaust is something different than genocide. Genocide is the plan control of a group of nation, kill, often using killing for the leadership, political, religious, military, etc. Not all have to be killed. What singles out the Holocaust is the fact that the Nazis, from a racial ideology, made it essential, seminal that all Jews are to be killed ultimately. They didn't, again, there's an argument, when did the Nazis reach that decision? 
the overwhelming historiography, the study of history maintains that it was a process in which the Nazis had different policies against the Jews. In the first period, the rise of the Nazis to power in 1933 until the beginning of World War II, 39, we're talking about legal, quote, not allow us to perform uh, in orchestras or go to or as the audiences for plays or, or musical uh, the, uh, evenings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that there is the attempt to fight. If all the Jews leave, we'll have solved the problem. Germany will be Judenrei. So it doesn't mean that you have to kill the Jews. And to expect the Jews to have to understood this from the beginning is not only, is it's ahistorical because most, the Nazis, perhaps Hitler had envisioned this, but most Nazis hadn't had the idea that it was going to reach that point. The second period is from 1939, the beginning of World War II, September 1939, till the beginning of mass murder in June 1941, the invasion into Russia. Here primarily, it's a process of isolating the Jews in all the occupied countries. Western Europe has Jews wearing, all countries except for Denmark had yellow stars that were occupied by the Nazis. Separate identification certificates, noting they were Jewish they, in, in France, they were Jews. There was isolation. There weren't sealed ghettos in Western Europe. Sealed ghettos existed basically in Eastern Europe, hermetically sealed uh, ghettos. And this was a partial solution until in one Nazi document that says, this is the final way and uh, it's the end seal, but not the end losing, not the final solution. Only in 1941 with the beginning of mass, does mass murder begin with the invasion into Russia. Now, those are important elements. These are Nazi initiated. They have, they have to be related to it. And you'll excuse me as I drink from the body. Uh, what, how do the Jews understand what's happening? What is the Jewish response? All too often, the Jews are viewed as being passive. In the extreme, it even talks about being going like sheep to the slaughter. The Jews were slaughtered, but not like sheep. And this is perhaps the most important point that we can make. Okay, the idea that, first of all, how did the Jews understand what was happening? Now, in Germany, they understood it was a legal system that was depriving them of their rights. They believed that this is an aberration. The Nazis are going against German history. 1869 was emancipation for the Jews. The Jews had achieved much. There was still symbolic anti, not symbolic, even official anti-Semitism. Jews couldn't be full judges or full professors until the end of World War I, when the super liberal Weimar Republic came into being and took away all those, those, those uh, uh, blackings, all those blacks to Jews to become full doctors, full professors, full judges, physicians in university, et cetera, et cetera. So the Jews basically saw Germany as a country that allowed them to be Jewish. Many sought to be German and Jewish, it's called acculturation. Assimilation is when you convert, you stop being Jewish. You know, there's a difference. Um, and all too often we use it too easily. But basically, if, if you look at the first period, what the Jews were responding to, a legal assault to get them against them, to get them, uh, to coerce them voluntarily, quotes, to emigrate. What do you have? you have a tremendous amount of activity by German Jews to confront this situation, defy this situation, and hang on until the storm blows over. Okay, it's only a matter of time. Hitler, what kind of politician was Hitler? His first job as a politician was prime minister, chancellor. He was never a state legislator. He was never a congressman or congressperson. He was never a senator. His first job in, in Germany after World War II had gone through a series of governments, of multiple, due to the crisis of, of both 
political nature, economic depression twice, both the world depression and their own depression because it's for reparations. They were considered to be guilty for the atrocities of World War I. Versailles Treaty ended World War I without a doubt. And there are many historians who say it was also the seeds of World War II. But any, this, is not, this is not at all to give a justification. But rather, what, how did the Jews respond? With tremendous resourcefulness, vitality, and creativity. Very few left the, not in the beginning. The first year the Nazis came to power, some 37,000 Jews left. Who were they? They were mostly the young who were not able to attend German universities or politicians who were slated to be imprisoned by the Nazis. Liberals, socialists, unionists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They left. Everybody else said, listen, we can hold on. So what did they do? First of all, they created an umbrella organization. German Jewry was highly divided, Orthodox, Reform, Socialists, Zionists, uh, liberals, people, you know, uh, uh, war veterans, et cetera, from World, War, from World War I. The idea, what did they do is, first of all, this is, a, we, this is a major onslaught, we have to be unified. Same lesson, by the way, was learned by American Jews after the war by creating the Conference of American Presidents. It avoids duplicity, it avoids contradictory initiatives, et cetera, et cetera. They create, create this creative body, they create this body that represents all facets of, Jew, of Jewish life in Germany. Secondly, Jews are thrown out of schools or limited the number of, of how many students could be Jewish in schools. They enlarge Jewish schools or create new Jewish schools. Jews are thrown out of sports organizations. They create their own organizations or add to it. That in, 19, in 1935, Jews are banned because their influence on culture and, uh, and art. You have to ban Jewish musicians. They cannot play German music, okay? And as a result, they have no jobs. Audiences, Jewish cannot go to performances in quote unquote Aryan theaters. What do they create? The Kulturbund, an association of culture that allowed for Jewish artists, musicians, et cetera, to be able to continue to make a living and allowed for Jews to be able to attend them and live their cultural life as they had somewhat, of course, curtailed before the war, okay? Yes, and also set up an office, that same office was set up to help those who wanted to emigrate, but emigration was not recommended or pushed for by the German Jewish establishment. If we consider ourselves loyal, dedicated German citizens who are willing to die and fight for Germany and 12,000 German Jews fought and died in World War I, then we have to show our loyalty to Germany by staying and waiting for Hitler to blow over. It's an ephemeral phenomenon, a passing, it's a passing phenomenon. Hold on until it's, it, gets, it gets bad or until they're thrown out of office. So th there was this attempt by Jews to try in various ways. Another, another example that hardly known, Marion Kaplan, a, a student, or what he called a, 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 an expert on, Jew, on German Jews, writes about the fact that the Nazis banned ritual slaughtering of, uh, uh, of animals for kosher, for, to make them kosher, shrita. Okay, so what did they do? They imported meat from Denmark but there were a number of Jews who clandestinely slaughtered, prepared in halachic fashion, chickens, to have kosher chickens. A, it was punishable, A, it was illegal. It was punishable by, by a prison sentence or worse. And nonetheless, they did it. So are we talking about a people who were simply passive, allowed itself just to be acted upon? And perhaps one of the most important elements was the life of the synagogue. On Saturdays and holidays, it would be used for services. During the week, they would have lectures on Jewish education, adult Jewish education, led by Martin Buber and Akiva and Ernst Simon. Okay? Buber only left Germany in 38 to come to Israel. He was still hoping that we're being defamed, we're being uh, uh, lied about. We're made to be embarrassed about Judaism. We have a lot to be proud of both as Jews and as Jews who have contributed to world civilization. 
And that's what's taking place in synagogues. So we have a greater awareness of Jewish consciousness, a return to Judaism for many people as well. But what you simply see, I can go on giving more and more and more examples. But what you see here, passivity, far from it. Activity, resourcefulness, and even danger. Okay, and I'll come back later to the other. No one considered odd resistance. It wasn't even part of the books. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't thought of. Germans didn't think about it. Who, a socialist who thought, hey, uh, you didn't fight militarily. Hey, you would lose. You'd be, it would be suicide. So that's the first point. When did that change? Kristallnacht, November 9th, 10th, 1939, eight, night of broken glass. When? Synagogues, some 1,400 synagogues were attacked, many burnt to the ground. If it was actually next to an adjacent building, the firefighters put it out so as not to burn the other building. A hundred Jews were killed approximately and some 30,000 Jews, young men, from 16 to 60 were sent to concentration camps. That was the turning point. After that, German Jews realized they couldn't weather the storm. They had to get out. Now the question is, and here's the other, we know what the Nazis want. We see now what the Jewish response was, which is rarely related to, if at all. And then now we have the world response. Where are they gonna go? Well, the world is closed to immigrants especially after the Great Depression of 1929. And to whom do I, an American president can ask for, in a very valid way, to whom do I have a greater obligation? To my own citizens and make sure that they have jobs that can make a living or to a foreign element that doesn't, is not part of my constituency, my obligation, moral and otherwise. Maybe moral, yes, but not, not from a political point of view. So that, what you have is the belief by German Jews, it's over. And in that year alone, 180,000 Jews left. And by the way, just to show you how the Jews didn't understand what was happening, of the 37,000 Jews who left in 1933, in 1934, 10,000 came back. Why? Because they weren't accepted well as immigrants. And, and where did they go to, by the way? Countries surrounding Germany, Denmark, Holland, France, etc with the belief that once this passes and Hitler is thrown out, we'll be able to go back. Otherwise, we'll allow living in poverty, out of our culture, our language. And they said, you know what? We're gonna go back to Germany. 10,000 went back. And this is the most important thing we have to remember. And I'm gonna say this throughout. We know the end of the story. We know, yes, the Nuremberg laws were passed depriving Jews of their citizenship and imposing racial ideology in a political framework, okay? However, they had no idea of the end. Even the Nazis, it seems, didn't. Again, most historians believe that the Nazis were looking at other ways to solve the Jewish question of what they called it. Throughout, whenever we, in all the periods we study, we'll see that the idea of mass murder never entered their minds, even later, for most people. There were a few who, who saw it. Avakovna in Vilna saw it. But when he was asked, how did you know in January 1942 that this mass murder all are gonna be killed? It was an intuition, he said, a poet's intuition. Well, to have a revolt in a ghetto in which the Nazis would come in and kill everybody or, or for the collective responsibility, that's a big risk. Most people did not believe, could not, they were confronting the unimaginable. Nothing like this had happened before, excuse me. Nothing like this had happened before. For us in our generation after World War II, it's part of our historical baggage. We know what happened in the Holocaust. Six million, uh, millions of people were killed, six million were Jews. So, but they didn't know that. Matter of fact, Ruth Bundy, who is a, a woman, a, a survivor from Czechoslovakia, from Prague, who later became a well-known journalist, reporting journalist, who had to do research as well, wrote a book in Hebrew, it's called, um, um, uh, Melmstein. It's about the Jacob 
Jacob uh, Edelstein, who was the head of the Judenrat in uh, in the Tresenstadt ghetto. She writes when she she writes about arriving in Auschwitz, and she says, "I was in Tresenstadt for two years. Yes, there were deportations to the east, but no one had any idea that there was a system of mass destruction, factory like murder of Jews." They said she had no idea, and here was a bright woman. Later, as I said, became a reporter. Oh, Negadazman. Uh, That's what it's called. And he both got the English name right now. But anyway, the point being is it was inconceivable. A sophisticated Western European nature, nation whose culture had contributed so much to Western civilization. Try imagine music without German contributors. And I mean, Großdeutschland, big uh, Germany, including Austria. No Bach, no Mozart. Imagine without philosophy, Hegel, Kant, etc. Without literature, Goethe, Schiller. Here is a country, not only was it a country that gave Jews emancipation, allowed Jews to produce, were part of that production, but themselves were highly elevated. It was a paragon, a model. And all of a sudden, they're going to kill men, women, and children in the middle of a war when they can use them as slave labor? Makes no sense. So it's constantly, perhaps the most important thing that I can leave you with is the fact, yes, we need to show what Jewish life was before the Holocaust, their vitality, their institutions, their contributions. Give them a personality. During the war as well, in the Holocaust, to show these initiatives. And these initiatives are done without believing that mass murder is going to take place. It's, it's beyond their ability to internalize. And as a result, when the Nazis continue their policies, as I said, the first one was 33 to 39. From 30, so you, again, here's the Nazi element. They create the framework. You can't tell the story sans Nazis without the Nazis. But not only, you don't only want to know how many concentration camps. Yes, the, the the, the 30,000 Jews that were sent to concentration camps were, were, were Buchenwald, Dachau, and Ravensburg, okay? What's that important? Is it more important to understand what were the activities of women to help their husbands get out of the concentration camps or the sons? Because if you could prove that you had a visa to leave the country, you were released from the concentration camps. And who was doing that? The wives and daughters that were left behind. Interestingly enough, the wives were the ones who wanted to get out more than the men because the men went to work, the wives encountered, the females encountered prejudice in stores, not being treated, being yelled at, their kids coming home from school, being beaten up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the role of women is very important here. And it's now in the second period when we deal now with the invasion to Poland and ultimately within the a ghetto, sealed ghettos are set up. But first of all, everyone has isolation, as I said. Yellow stars, papers, etc. When the ghettos are set up, even before the ghettos are set up, I want to say, Emanuel Regal, who was known for his underground archives, set up the House Committees, which by 1940, before the deportation, 1942, had almost 2,000 members. Jews lived in major cities around courtyards. Each courtyard had a number of apartment buildings and they set up a committee, the whole courtyard committees, to make sure that everyone was taken care of in, the, in that courtyard. If there were refugees, they were housed in, the, let's say, in a synagogue in, in the basement or in other areas. If make sure that the poorer families had no food, they were invited once a day to a, a meal by a family that had more means. And the evenings, they had cultural uh, uh, activities through an organization called YIKOR, Y-I-K-O-R. You could go on and on and on, sessions, camps for the children, educational sessions for the children. In the ghettos, you had this already organization of helping one another. I'm not saying everyone was, everyone was a saint. No, definitely. But not every, but the overwhelming majority realized that they needed to be have mutual support, support, mutual aid. And this was a major way of encountering the ways of the ghetto. Now, besides that, you have here's another role of women's. 
Once the ghettos are sealed, they want to know what's happening in other ghettos, and, uh, and ghettos want to know what's happening in, in other ghettos want to know what's happening in Warsaw. The Jewish underground sends out couriers. Who are the couriers to pass on information and get information? Women. Blonde hair, blue eyed women who could pass as Aryans who spoke Polish without a Yiddish accent. Not a small feat. Okay? Why couldn't it be men? Because all they would have to do is tell them drop their trousers and they would see the circumcised and a man would be caught. So that as a result, you have the band of couriers, some who were caught and tortured going around, bringing the information, spreading the information, telling people ultimately don't get on the trains. Don't believe the Nazi deception. You're going to be work to work. But in the ghetto period, it tells you what's going on in various ghettos, Jews being sent to labor camps, etc. not to be killed yet, is up before 41, and bringing it back in which they then circulate underground newspapers. Daniel Blotman's research talks about 100 underground newspapers in Poland alone. France had a Jewish underground newspaper. Belgium had an underground newspaper. This is putting up posters. These are things that carry high punishment, punishment if not the threat, of, not a penalty of death. And yet it was done because Jews needed to be informed what was happening so as to be able to make decisions. Jews needed to, to withstand the slaughter that was taking place, not physically, but starvation, walking over bodies. The Lodge Ghetto was a phenomenal situation. A very controversial head of the Yudrat, Rubkovsky, initiates a plan to make Lodge, which was a textile center and a, uh, the Manchester of Poland, was to, to make it a something that works for the Nazis. You give us the raw materials, we'll give you finished products. Don't forget, in Poland, Jews were primarily the shoemakers, the tailors, etc. So they worked both for German manufacturers and even the German war industry. But that allowed for, and thus when they, the finished products will get them food. In, in, in Ludge, you don't see like in Warsaw, dead bodies on the street. It's much more, people die at home from starvation, but not mass of, on the street. Bumkowski was able to also get Shabbat to be the day off and have high holiday services. They baked matzot in the Ludge ghetto. You've, I can go on and on and on. The point being is there is Jewish initiative to make the Jews essential to the Nazis. And thus Ludge, which should have been one of the first ghettos to be removed or liquidated or, or but, uh, any term you want to use, because it was in an area that was incorporated into the Reich. It became part of Germany proper versus Warsaw, which was in the General government, the general government, large rather being one of the first, so as to pure, quote unquote purified uh, uh, Germany, German areas of Jews, was the last ghetto in Poland to be destroyed. Matter of fact, yes, Bukowski is controversial because he agreed to give up children, the non productive, the elderly, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, when the Nazis asked for this. He was beaten up by the Nazis and he often brought it down the list and got it to be less. But nonetheless, there is a moral question here. Does he have a right to play God? And it's a very problematic one. Another Yudinot leader who was told to give a list, okay? He said, here's a list, four people, my wife, myself, and my two children. They're the only ones I'm responsible for. They're the only ones that I could do. His name was Lemberg. So the point being that the Jews made themselves essential and Ludge, rather than being the first ghetto destroyed, was the last one. Matter of fact, the question that's asked, and historians don't like to ask questions, what if? But the truth of the matter is that it was, it was finally liquidated, the Lodge ghetto, only in July and August of 1944. The Russian army was three days march away. They stopped because they had overrun their lines of supply. If the, if the Red Army would have come in and liberated Ludge with 60,000 uh, with 60,000 in residents, would, how would we look at Lubkovsky today? As a controversial figure or as a savior of the Jews? And I don't have an answer. So the point being is you have in the ghetto soup kitchens, aid, underground activities, archives being created to document, and these are done clandestinely. 
People write only initials, afraid the Nazis will catch it, especially by Shimon Huberban, who was Ringelblum's accomplice in the underground archives of the Warsaw Ghetto. So that the idea of the Jews going being passive is not only incorrect and counter historical, it's insulting. And the survivors often felt this after the war. How did you survive? You must have done something, something not kosher. Uh, but what happens if you survive for other reasons? Because luck, because you were hidden, you got a hold of forged papers. In and of itself, getting forged papers was, was problematic, an underground activity. You hide. Are we talking about passive, passivity? And like, again, I can go on and on and on. We're talking about initiative, not everybody. There were people who broke down, couldn't, couldn't function, but they were not the majority. Now, in 1941, the Nazis begin the mass murder of the Jews. And you have a situation, again, the Nazis create the situation. It begins with Einsatzgruppen, mobile killing units of the shooting of Jews outside towns, villages, uh, or cities. Outside of Vilna was Ponar, okay? The Kovno was the ninth fourth, these sites, which as different the concentration, the concentration camps in Germany like Dachau, the Nazis let known because they were using that, if you don't toe the line in the early period, this is what happens to enemies of the Reich, Jews and others. Now, what takes place when the Jews are rounded up and brought to the pits to be killed? Well, you have actions that are, for instance, individual ones. A butcher going at one of the Nazi guards and biting his neck and killing him, and of course being shot in the spot. Another or cases like that. But you also have organized, excuse me. There's the famous story of Rabbi Daniel's sermon. Lithuania in the town of Chilm, okay? The rabbi led his flock out to the pits in which they were about to be killed and he realized what was about to be happy. They were going to happen. They were going to be shot and, ki and killed. And he looked to the German officer in charge. He goes, I would like to address my flock before you proceed. And he started beginning and talking Yiddish, of course, to his congregation and to the community. And he said, this, we are now get ready to meet your creator. You are dying al Kiddush Hashem on the sanctification of life. You have done nothing wrong. The world has often chosen Jews as being the, 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 the victims of all ills in society. We have our laws, our customs, our beliefs, our community actions, our community organizations, especially. And all of a sudden, the Nazis were getting disconcerted because they would see parents stroking their children's head, comforting them as they were about to be killed. And it so unnerved the German command that he goes to him, are you finished yet? And he goes, not yet. And he continues talking and allows his, his, his congregants, his community to meet their ultimate destiny and death with calmness and belief, not all, but a great many. And then he ends and he goes to the Nazi commander, you can take over now. Now, is this spiritual resistance? Without a doubt. Nazis tried dehumanizing the Jews. Did they remain human? Yes, very much. In the camps, anyone, all research concludes, no one survived the, the concentration camps of death camps as a lone wolf. You needed a partner, be it someone who had political views like yourself, religious views like your, like your own, or coming from the same area, locality. You couldn't work alone. Someone had to, you had to work together with others to get extra bread, to get a new pair of shoes after yours was worn out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Women especially, became a subgroup, was called Lagerschwesterin, camp sisters who took care of the young that was in their midst, etc. Religious life continued. You have a story. I'm now working in a Holocaust Museum in, in Budapest. And there is a story of the Vatsena Dayan in the city of Vach. And 
I knew of the story, but I went to see the actual place or location. The story was as following. He was, the Jews of, of, Austria, of, excuse me, of Hungary were only deported in 1944. Until then, they were, Hungary was an ally of Germany and, and in March 1944 occupied Hungary. So it has a very special fate. There was no yellow star, there were no ghettos, et cetera, et cetera. There were anti-Jewish laws. And especially there were labor battalions where Jews were enlisted to the army, not as to fight, but as to be mules. And they, thousands died in the snow and carry and terrible conditions. And this is before the Nazis, because the Hungarians like to say, it all happened after the Nazis came in. So thus it's a, the Nazis who are responsible. It's not, it's, that's not exactly the truth. But the point being is the, there was in one of the barracks at Auschwitz, a barracks full of yeshiva students who were given the notice that the next day on Erev Shana they were going to be sent to the gas chamber and they, they were locked up. They asked for one thing, that someone come in and blow the shofar for them. The Weizen of Dayan, who by the way survived with his son, the rest of his family was killed, so his son was with him and he knows about the story, he could tell it firsthand. We also have it documented in three separate oral testimonies because when we use that old testimony, we have to be careful that it's accurate. Not because people are lying, God forbid, although that, that, there have been cases of that as well. Uh, 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 in Switzerland, of someone faking to be a survivor, writing a book, et cetera, et cetera, or of a, a couple that sent apples to each other over the fence. That I'm not talking about. That's that's something into itself. But you have a situation of memory. How do you remember? What do you remember? Your subject information. Maybe you're incorporating the stories you heard later but didn't experience yourself. So we always, when oral testimony has to be verified. How do you verify it? If somebody else tells the situation who doesn't know the person you're talking about. The Vachina Rebbe, the stories about him come from three different oral testimonies. One in Israel, one in Mexico and one in Venezuela, no contact with each other, telling the same story. The Vachin of Rebbe, the, the Dayan, he goes, in, and now, by the way, they, they exist in, 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 in Chicago. And there's a Vites in the school, et cetera, it's a small group. But the point being is he goes into the barracks. He had got, the Lodge deportees had brought a shofar with them. He got the people who were working in Canada, this storehouse, to bring him a shofar. And he went in and his son says, don't go in. If they come, suddenly come and lock the doors because they're due for extermination to be killed in the gas chambers, you'll be caught too. He goes, this is what they want. This is what I can do for them. He went in and he blew the shofar for them. Moreover, and this is the most amazing. He built a sukkah in Birkenau. Between two barracks, there were extra plywoods and beds. He simply set up that as the, being the false roof. He had three sides and he was able to perform the, the commandment of eating in a booth on the holiday of Sukkot. Again, passive. Now, we didn't talk about armed resistance and I purposefully didn't do that until the end. Why? Because passive resistance, especially to young people, excuse me, uh, uh, military resistance, armed resistance, especially to younger, uh, is very alluring. And what it does is, if you overly concentrate on that, it minimizes all the other activities and initiatives undertaken to defy the Nazis, which may have forging documents, couriers getting out information, illegal newspapers, etc. However, in over 90 ghettos in Eastern Europe, and, and this has been verified, had undergrounds armed undergrounds who wanted to fight the Nazis. However, what was one of the major problems? Most people in the ghettos believed that they would survive the war. It was a concept called Iberleben. And I say that with responsibility, most believed it. First of all, you couldn't imagine it, as I said before. Iberleben, hold on. We will, we, the war will come to an end. Who will win? Who will lose? The good guys will win, the allies, and the Nazis are clearly the bad guys they're going to lose. That's a universal belief. It was held by everyone throughout Europe. The only occupied country to make a peace treaty with Nazi Germany was Vichy France, the co collaborationist government in France. The only one. Everyone believed to wait until the war is over. 
And then if the war is over, let's hold on and we can survive. We'll make ourselves essential to the Nazis, like in Ludge, et cetera. And they almost did survive. And then there's another element, which is a Jewish element. Look at Jewish history. The Jews have been persecuted and even threatened with mass murder and extermination beforehand. Look at the story of Purim, where they were all scheduled to be murdered and they were saved in the end. Where's the Roman civilization? Where's the Persian civilization? Where's the Greek civilization? The study of Hanukkah. They're not here anymore, but who's here maintaining their values and beliefs and their culture? The Jews. So ultimately, yes, Jew, there will be Jews who will suffer. Many will die, but though, those who are central to the Nazis have a chance to remain. And by the way, the truth of the matter is, in, 19, in 2022, we can say they're right. Where are the Nazis and where are the Jews? But I'm not talking about looking at it from, from how we see it. What we know, without the historical baggage, without knowing what's going to happen. And yet, there were those who chose to rise up in armed revolt. In the Warsaw Ghetto, they realized that the deportation of 265,000 Jews started in July of, of 1943 could not have taken place if there would have perhaps been something that would have stopped them, the Nazis, we have to fight. And in Warsaw Ghetto, they set up the Jewish fighting organization and fought the Nazis and kept them at bay from April 19th, the first night of Pesach, okay, and, and, and it was supposed to be Himmler's birthday present to Hitler, to middle of May, May 20th, approximately, was the end of the fighting. The longest lasting rebellion of it in Europe in an urban setting. But it was not the only one. There were at least almost, there were at least 10 other ghetto revolts, armed revolts, in Bialystok, in Lachva, in Tichin. We can go on and on and on. Why were they able to revolt in, in Warsaw? Because the population supported them. They believed that they were all going to be killed because of the, the enormity of the danger they had just encountered in deportations. And also the underground had spread news that they knew the trains were going to Chubwekut, which was where Warsaw Jewelry was sent, but none, they came back empty. No food trains were going in. So they had reports, which they published in their newspapers or their leaflets, et cetera, don't get on the trains. And as a result, this approximately 60,000 Jews that remained in the Warsaw Ghetto supported the armed uprising supported the youth movements, they were young, because the young usually go, accept, uh, go against the accepted views, the status quo, et cetera, et cetera, Without the, and also had no family obligation. In Vilna, however, the population was against the underground, felt the un underground endangered them, that it would result in the Nazis coming in and taking retribution and wiping them all out. And as a result, they decided if they rose up in revolt in the United Protestant Organization, FPO in Yiddish, they would be fighting their fellow Jews, not only the Nazis. And thus, that would be to be absurd. And as a result, they would decide to go out to the forest and join the partisans. But it wasn't without question. It wasn't without dilemma. Abba Kovner tells the story, the head of the Vilna Underground, okay? He tells the story that when he was about to leave, his mother came to him and said, who's going to take care of me? I'm an old, brittle, young, old lady who can't take care of herself. And he goes, I have to go. This is, this is what Jewish destiny calls me for do, to do. And many years later, at a conference in New York, Abba Kovner, the great Israeli poet, uh, asked, Ha'im ani ben shebagad b'imo o gibor b'Yisrael. Am I a son who abandoned his mother or, or, or am I a hero in Israel? It's a dilemma. But what's clear is there was all types of types of underground organization, of uh, underground initiatives, defiance against the Nazis, confronting Nazi rise to power, polemical, putting out newspapers, education, spiritual and armed response as well. In three out of the six death camps, there were revolts. In Treblinka, Sobibor, and in Auschwitz. True, not, a great, not too great success. 
In Auschwitz, they succeeded in blowing up one of the crematoria, crematorium four, I believe, but no one really escaped, okay? In Treblinka, some 100, some 300 escaped, but most were caught or shot down later. So 100 survived, okay? So that even when they did it, it didn't mean, they knew they weren't choosing whether to die, but as different than the majority who believed in Ibele, when they decided all were going to die, and this is how we expect, this is how we want to die. This is how we want to die. Or as one person in the Krakow uh, ghetto put it, for three pages, for three lines in the pages of history, Justina wrote that. So the question here is, there is a Jewish perspective. Where is this? Where are all the things I just talked about? They're not there. You want an example of it? Here's a classic example of it. Steven Spielberg is a genius. Who am I to say he's a genius? You're right, it's not, it's not very modest. But he knew exactly the level of horror that the general audience could accept. And thus Schindler's List was able to reach not only Jewish audiences, but mass audiences throughout the United States and the world, okay? How were the Jews depicted in Schindler's List? Schindler is the major, he's, the, he's representative of God. There's that famous scene that I'll remind you of, that Schindler is walking around the room, reading off the names to Ben Kingsley, who is Isaac Stern typing up the list, okay? And, and at one point, Kingsley says to Liam Neeson, because I don't have to smoke, you're so close to me, I'm inhaling your smoke. You remember that scene? Look what it means. Who's the, who's the hero here? Who saves the Jews? Schindler. What did the Jews do? Basically nothing, including the fact including the fact that, that not only the Jews did nothing, but that they themselves often fought who would get on the list. Now, it's a historical. First of all, Kings, Isaac Stern did not make up the list. The woman who made up the list just passed away at 107, uh, or 97, I'm sorry, a few days ago. Schindler wasn't involved with making up the list because he didn't know the individuals. Isaac Stern knew who the individuals were important, who, could be, who, who should be taken over to Czechoslovakia. And look at his line at the end. It's uh, over-romanticized. If I only would have known, I, I would have tried saving more Jews. I would have sold my rings, etc. In other words, the savior, the actions were all by Schindler. The Jews were objects. And I can give you dozens of examples like that. The pianist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In books, et cetera. The Jews are something that are not center stage. And I'm saying the Jewish perspective requires us to give, it's not, it's not an either or, as I said. It's percentages. How much of your, let's use a crass term, how much of your real estate, your space in a, in a museum do you actually give to each of those subjects? That it, what the Nazis did, the framework they consisted of, how the Jews understood what was happening and based on their perceptions, how they responded and world response. Now, everything has to be site specific. If I'm doing, if I'm doing a, a museum in Hungary, I definitely wanna go very heavy into world before because it was very unusual. It had the Neolog movement, uh, a conservative acts movement, when it's called reform, it's totally wrong a major movement. There was integration, Jews, Jews, uh, even Hasidic rabbis sang Hungarian songs, okay? So that what you have here is every place is different and you have to know who your audience is and what messages and goals do you want to impart? Because they're not going to remember each fact. But if you, overall, if you show the Jews as being dasa, you will not have empathy on the contrary. You might have a situation where you blame the victim. Couldn't they have done something? Why didn't they rise up in revolt? And Primo Levi talks about this openly. We are accused. Survivors in the beginning talked about this openly. We were told not to talk about our experiences. Matter of fact, when I did the Ludge exhibition at Yad Vashem, the survivors told me we were embarrassed because we weren't like Warsaw when they raised up a revolt. That's why Ludge gets, uh, survivors were so small, were so, were so quiet, I'm sorry in the action, uh, in the organizations for survival organizations. So what you have, and a world response depends where you are as well. If you're in America, you're gonna talk about American world response. If I'm in Hungary, I'm gonna talk about the Hungarian regime. 
It all depends who your audience is. If you're in a Catholic school, you have to deal with the dilemma, of course, of the Vatican. In other words, there no one is telling all elements and all parts of the story. You can't. A museum is not a book on a wall. You have to be able to choose what you want based on what the messages and takeaways that you want. That's what you have to think of. Not only when they walk out of the museum or out of your classroom, but two weeks from now, when they think about it. You have to be wary of shock. The subject is shocking enough. You don't have to embellish it. If you embellish it, you're gonna cause a catharsis I've tried, I've paid my due, my, uh, my, hom my hom homage to the victims. I don't want anything to do with the subject. If you make it, if it's a, a catalyst that it raises questions, what, how did Jewish society survive after all these years? How did it outlive other civilizations? How did that culture, act, how did that culture and, and that world respond during the Holocaust, et cetera? You will then have given them food for thought and not trying to avoid it because that's what you avoid something that's a shock. And what's very important is that it's not only, as I said, during the, not the periods of the war, it's even the post-war period. The post-war period is, what's the, okay? The Jews in the DP camps. And here you have, but not only DP camps, you have the scene of liberation. Liberation for the Jews was different than any other victims in the, in the camps. All other victims were able to be happy, enjoy themselves, were joyous. They had homes to return to, families to return to, communities to return to. Jew, and Spielberg quoted perfectly in the movie, when they announced in the factory, in the auditorium, that the war is over, the Nazis have lost, there was a sigh of relief and total quiet. And the next scene goes into someone saying the Kaddish. They, for Jews, it was a bittersweet experience. Yes, they were free. They had outlived Hitler. They defeated Hitler. But what did they, where were they gonna go? What did they have left? And there was no small measure of guilt survival complex. What did I do that could have saved my brother, my sister, my parents, et cetera, et cetera. So the Jews had a totally different situation which shows the singularity of the Jewish experience and which is essential to understand. So when we talk about, quote unquote, how we tell the story, the Nazis have to be there, but they're not the primary, they're not the primary actors. The Jews are, have to be the primary actors both before, during, and after. How they rebuilt their lives, how the state of Israel was created, how Jewish communities reestablished and, and Hasidic courts reestablished in Israel and America, et cetera. When we talk about the, the survivors and the second generation, it's a miracle. That after such horror and trauma, they were able to relive their lives, raise families, not forgetting about the Holocaust. It's very common to see names like Nechama as the name of children and, or, or marriages that were what they called Hitler brides because Hitler made them brides. So it wasn't a, a large pool. The Jews had a singularly different experience than all other groups. The one that comes closest to them are gypsies, but no other group was scheduled for total mass murder without exception. There is the final solution is the Holocaust and there's genocide. There are two different things. Genocide uses killing, but selected killing. Holocaust is a total killing of all without exception. Okay, uh, how are we doing for time? We are perfectly on time. I just want to thank- never before. <laughs> I just want to thank everybody for participating. We have a couple of questions that have come in on the chat. If you still have a question, please feel free to send it either to us or to everyone. The first question is about your involvement in the um, House of Faith Museum in Hungary, uh, which seems to be garnering a lot of controversy. If you could speak about your involvement in the museum and the controversy. OK, I'm not a politician. Um... So I, know, I try keeping you away from the politics, but ultimately it affects you. I mean, it, it impacts upon it. Um, 
the major controversy was that when the Hungarian government set up the building, the building exists. It has a big Jewish star on it. They can't use anything else for it, use it for anything else. Um, they gave it over to a, a Hungarian historian who had done a very impressive uh, museum in Budapest called the House of Terror. Impressive because I'm saying museological tools and, and simulation or um, the uh, um, environmental situations she created. Eight years after I was there, I remembered certain rooms because uh, I went back again. But I remembered before I walked in. The problem was that this historian, um, uh, Schmidt, uh, uh, she was comparing in the House of Terrors the two evils that beset Hungary not in the 20th century. Nazism, of course, when it occupied Hungary in 1944, and afterwards when the Soviet Union took over and it was a satellite state and the communists. Now, so she deals with fascism, with, with Nazism and communism as two elements that impacted and uh, uh, undermined Hungarian society in terrible cruelties. Well, the problem is here that a large percentage, the Jews were overrepresented over in the communist party, both in leadership and membership. So that the, the victims of the first case of the Nazi Holocaust became the perpetrators in the second case, which is to put it mildly, very, very problematic. Even I saw it before getting involved when I went to my first visit to Hungary around 10 years ago, okay? Um, and she was criticized uh, across the board by the International Holocaust Remembrance Authority, Yad Vashem, across the board. Ultimately, the Jewish community asked to take it over from her. And they were given the right to take it over. They wanted us to work with her. We tried, impossible. I was at the meetings. And we decided we were going to go on our own with the, go government, of, uh, with the government of Hungary support. They turned to, my, to me, to Esther Farbstein, a, a top scholar on religious responses during the Holocaust in Poland and, and in Hungary, who recommended me to, as the, the curator. And we put together, a, I put together a vision paper uh, with the team putting it. And we said, you cannot use our names because of the controversy until the government gives its seal of approval to that vision document, what we want to do. Our goals, our methodology, our emphasis on the Jews, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Hungarian government did it, both at an IRA conference in, in, in Luxembourg. Then they backtracked a little because Maria Schmidt had a lot of uh, clout. And we still don't own the building, but we're giving money by the government to continue with our project as per the vision document that was created and we're going along. And now because of Corona, I mean, I used to go to every other week. Now Corona, now, there's no traveling. Um, uh, we're, working, we're able to work on documents, in other words, actual texts that we uh, an academic advisory board we had put together. So that you could do through Zoom. So it's going slower than we had, but we're finding unbelievable artifacts. I talked about Vach, that the, 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 that Rabbi, the, the Dayan from Vach. I went to the city of Vach to see where the Jewish community was. Hungary was so safe up until 1944, till the Nazis entered, that Slovakian and Polish Jews escaped and had uh, uh, received haven in Hungary by and helped by the Jewish community and set up institutions for them. One of them were in Vach, in the building that the Jews had this, uh, the, these refugees, Polish Jewish refugees, children from, uh, that were in Hungary. I found a gate with a Jewish star on it. Well, rest assured, it's no longer there. It's going into, it's going into the museum. There are fascinating things still around. So it's continuing, it's continuing more slowly than wanting because than we wanted both because of Corona and government situations. Orban just won the elections, the head of, uh, excuse me, the head of the government in, in, in Hungary, the prime minister, and he has to create a coalition government. Uh, as a result, uh, until we know what the coalition, who are the coalition partners and how important the Jewish card is to them, we won't know what the type of support the government will give. So right now it's scheduled for opening for 2024. We're working on, on a, low fake, a low flame, but it's still there and it's still exciting. I hope that answers the question. Anyone? Are you there?
Sarah, you are muted. Sarah, you are Sorry, muted. if you have any other questions, please feel free to send them in the chat. In the meantime, I'm going to turn to the director of the Fish Center, Dr. Shai Pilnek, for a few words. Uh, Dr. Meza was, first of all, hello, everyone. I'm Shai Pilnik. I am the director of the Emil and Jenny Fish Holocaust and Genocide Studies Center at Yeshiva University. I'm so uh, excited that so many of you have taken the time on uh, Mother's Day to join us uh, for this talk. And Seri, I wanted to thank you for the phenomenal, the phenomenal job you've done, not only bringing uh, Mr. Mays here, but also for putting together this entire uh, series. Um, I wanted to, if you can also, um, you, you can also glance when you look at the chat and the Q&A session that we have, that in this series, the Holocaust is not dealt with just as a past event, but rather as an event that deeply affects the present moment. So, um, Mr. Mays, I was wondering if um, you can maybe share with us some of the, you mentioned the fact that you're not a politician, which is fair enough. I also see myself as an educator, and we are here training the next generation of educators. But your, what in your mind are the main um, issues that um, turn Holocaust studies into a politicized theme? If you, first of all, if you think it is oh. politicized today, and also if you can pick the top examples of where the educational mission becomes, I would say, naturally and obviously, obviously also political. Okay. First of all, it's an excellent question. And uh, do we have another hour for me to answer? Um, you do, but let's take two, just for okay. the sake of our audience. Yes. Um, first of all, there are a number of levels. There's people are always concerned about Holocaust deniers. I'm not a big concern about Holocaust deniers because it's a fringe movement. It's not a major movement. It's usually people that have a predisposition of anti-Semitism and just uh, they don't want the Holocaust being used because it only helps Israel or Jews, et cetera, to get a, a certain sense of, a, uh, uh, of status. The victim always is elevated on a moral pedestal. Uh, and so they should be understood, they should be helped, et cetera. So that, to avoid that, they say it never happened. The Jews are just taking advantage of us. Well, that's absurd. So, I, But I, I make sure that when I, I don't, when I do a Holocaust museum, I assume that I can make mistakes. I always have academic advisory committees look over both concept and each text. And I can say I'm very happy. I don't like a lot of texts and I minimize texts. It's not a book on a wall. It's not an encyclopedia. No one's going to remember it all. Um, uh, not every event can be brought. You have to, based on the mission, the messages and legacy that you want, you have to choose. So Holocaust and I, is, I know it's, it's easy to point them out, but I'm not over, I personally am not overly concerned about them, okay? Now you have people who are not Holocaust deniers, but misinformed. And here we have the foreign minister of Russia a week ago, making a statement that is to say the least problematic, which not only shows ignorance, but shows blaming the victim. Uh, so it's very far reaching. So I'm, I'm always concerned when, I'm not saying Israel is perfect, okay? But when, when we're compared, I can understand people using terms like apartheid, okay? I understand that, okay? I think it's extreme, it may not be valid, but it's not the point. But to say we're carrying out a final solution to the Palestinian question is a little too far. That's ignorance, that's that's, that's the, another type of Holocaust denial in, uh, in an ironic point of view. It's using the Holocaust in a way that's incorrect, invalid, and ahistorical. Um, you know, doing, I'm not getting into American politics for sure, uh, but as we know in the previous administration, there were a lot of references made, 1938, another situation. We all forget one thing. Yes, the situation was, is very different for Jews today. Jews are no longer, the end of Jewish powerlessness began with the creation of the state of Israel and ability for Israel to defend itself and to defend Jews in distress 
in danger in countries abroad. Think about Ethiopian Jews. Think about Entebbe. We all think about RRT, war, but it was an air, it was an Air France, it was a national airlines. Who had more of a responsibility to free the to free the Jews that were separated? Who went in? Entebbe. The end of powerlessness. It doesn't make us all all powerful. We can't do more Jews are killed in Israel because of hostilities of the uh, of terrorist hostilities than Jews throughout the world. So again, there's no simple answers. There's no yes and no. But po politically, it's used. There's no question about it, uh, both positively and negatively. And I, I think, I think we ourselves. I, now I come back to the beginning of my talk. We have to use critical faculties. And think of it not only because it was said said the Holocaust, I automatically accept it. All my no, think about it. Does that make sense? Is that a valid use? Do you need that example? Okay, you know you have Hanukkah, you have Purim, you have other examples, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, I, again, it's a very big question, uh, and I have very radical views, so I don't want to spend. I'm here as an educator and not as a politician. My own views, my wife has to deal with, and my children who are very much against me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm Itzik, sorry. Itzik, we have we have one more question from from the Please. audience that I think we can take. Um, Paul Kutna, yeah. There is there is a question about there is a question about um, spiritual resistance. It does yes. seem uh, like um, a fairly neglected uh, subject uh, in comparison with the armed resistance. If you can recommend any book, the question was if. Um, a phrase as a, by way of uh, asking why isn't there a book written about uh, about the various levels of resistance? But if you know any book or a number of books, if there's any recommendations that you well, can provide us with. This is a little self-serving, but it's out of print. But uh, I was the editor and contributor to a book that had over 30 first-person uh, narratives, uh, testimonies, not everyone survived, of exam besides three essays by D Professor David Engel of NYU, Dr. Eva Fogelman and myself, to, Eva wrote the last chapter of Blaming the Victim. Me and David Engel wrote the first two, I wrote, he wrote the first, I wrote the second. And it's, he talks about Jewish time versus Nazi time. And I talk about the various ways in which Jews defied the Nazis based on a Swiss historian's book and research called an, an individual called Werner Rings, who talked about occupation in Europe, all Europeans, not only Jews. Okay, and he lists five types. He lists spiritual, polemic, uh, uh, defensive, sabotage, uh, sorry, not sabotage, uh, forging papers, newspapers, etc. And then he lists individual offensive uh, argument uh, actions like uh, the butcher biting the teeth of uh, or killing, uh, biting the throat of a Nazi god, and then armed resistance. In my in the book that's called Daring to Resist Jewish Defiance in the Holocaust, and we hopefully it'll get republished, there are examples that show all five of these type of uh, all, all all I I, mean, I made it into four. I felt I didn't want to distinguish between offensive and organized military, so I made it all that together. But other than that, it was four types of resistance throughout all periods of Nazi uh, regime by Jews and sources that often have. Some of them were tra never translated into English. So it's the first time. So it's called uh, 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 Daring to Resist Jewish Defiance in the Holocaust uh, from the Museum of Jewish Heritage. And it was published in 2007. But it's out of print. You can get it on Amazon. I'm, so, I'm sure someone wants to get rid of it. Uh, so okay. th that's one book. Yuri Sewell wrote a book many years ago. It's a little antiquated uh, called They Fought Back, uh, which talks about both types. And then there have been various monographs. One of the problems is that a lot of the claims that were made against the Jews were because Jewish sources hadn't been investigated. The classic and most, one of the most important works written about the Holocaust was Raoul Hilberg's The Destruction of European Jewry. Hilberg, the late, the late, the late, the late Raoul Hilberg writes in his preface and in the introduction, this is a book about the perpetrators, not about, about the, the victims. And yet he oversteps his own boundary because he says, I don't know Yiddish. 
I don't know Polish. I don't know the sources. I know German. That's what I checked the bureaucracy. And yet he oversteps his own self-imposed limitations and comes to the conclusion that the Jews were basically passive. Either they eva evaded, avoided, there were some actions, but very few, et cetera. And Hilberg had a major influence as an historian because he wrote such a seminal work, uh, which almost never got published. It was only published in 1961 by an obscure uh, publishing house in, uh, in, because such a hot potato, uh, in, in Quadrangle Press in Chicago. Uh, so think about it, the most important Holocaust, one of the most important books that the Holocaust almost never got published. And Yad Vashem reneged on publishing the book, I had an agreement with him. And only four or five years ago actually published in Hebrew. Right. Does that answer the question? Thank you. Yes. Okay. We have Anything one else? Yeah, we Hello. have we have one last question. Um, assuming, the, assuming the museums around the world make the changes you think are necessary to the presentation of the Holocaust, how do you think will be critiqued 30 years from now? In other words, much Ooh. of what you're, you criticize stem from what started with the watershed moment of Schindler's List. So approximately- the no, 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 no. It started before him. It, it was easier to use the Nazi story because you had Nazi photographs, you had Nazi documentation. You hadn't had yet the materials done the monographs, the individual studies on Warsaw, Ludge, Krakow, uh, uh, et cetera, Lublin came much later. So you needed to go into Jewish sources that weren't easily available in languages that often the scholars didn't know. Interestingly enough, major scholars were not Jewish, like Chris Browning does not read Yiddish, but Tim Snyder from Yale does. And that, he reads Yiddish, Polish, Russian, he's amazing, okay? That, that's a rarity. So that what you had is an Israeli school of research that de dealt with Jewish response, an American school of re research that dealt with what they were able to do, either the Nazis, the rise of the Nazis, its implications. Listen, it has major relevancy. The Nazis used democracy to destroy democracy. That's a universal lesson. That's not, it doesn't pertain to Jews per se. Its ultimate end shows what happened to the Jews. Its violations of civil rights pertain to the Jews and some of the gypsies as well and other groups. Uh, the Nazis also persecuted Jehovah Witnesses. Dachau, majority of inmates of Dachau prior to Kristallnacht were not Jewish. They were Nazi political enemies, okay? Or Jehovah Witnesses who refused to, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, swear allegiance to Hitler, et cetera, et cetera, or homosexuals, gays. Uh, lesbians were not incarcerated. They could, they were there to be re, quote unquote, re-educated. Uh, uh, and if you were, and if you could prove you were re-educated, you were released. If you were Jehovah's Witness and said, I will, you know, I will join the army and swear allegiance to the Fuhrer, to Hitler, you were released. Jews got released in the early years only if they could prove they could get out. And they would no longer be there. Okay, now, how, how will it change? First, of most, first and foremost is awareness. You'd be surprised that there's changes. My wife recommends books that I should read because I basically read th things in the field. She gave me a book the other day and I bought it to show it to you. I don't know if you can see it. It's called, We Were the Lucky Ones, written by Georgia Hunter. We Were the Lucky Ones, written by Jordan Hunter, okay? And what is amazing is, it's a series of people who took various initiatives to get out of Europe and a whole family in six or seven, maybe eight different ways survived. There was Jewish initiative. She, I don't think the author was intending to write about Jewish initiative, but that's what came across, okay? And that's fantastic. So is that, does that show a change as an individual? Does it carry through to others? Some, Susan Fabrick Schaefer wrote an excellent book called Anya. Matter of fact, I thought she was a survivor. She wrote so, so succinctly and so close to the heart. Uh, and she even talks about what it's like having a teenage child growing up in America and, and the problems that a, a parent survivor has with her children. Fascinating book. Susan Fabrick Schaefer has written about Vietnam, about a number of things. She teaches in Brooklyn, she taught at Brooklyn College. The book is Anya. She definitely shows you pre, doing, and after. 
I read it so many years ago, I have to now look at it again about the Jewish perspective, I have to, about Jewish activities. I don't recall. So I'm not claiming ignorance, but just forgetfulness. That's the age. Okay. Dr. Mays, Dr. Mays, if I, Mr. Mays, uh, Itzik, we, we can go Itzik. Oh, I'm sorry. And the last question is, what will be in 30 years? Shai, you tell them what happens to prophets. Nevi'im hem shotim. Okay? Prophets are not considered to be uh, sane <laughs> or, or and, wise. And the wisest. That's right. Um, Itzik, you are an educational force of nature. I wanted, first of all, to thank you for speaking for um, actually close to two hours. We started first with our students, to our students um, and to our community members. Um, you know, I, I think museum goers normally think that to put together a display at a museum is so simple. They think that uh, perhaps it may be even simpler than writing a book. And I felt that this lecture really showed how difficult it is and how much you have to be cognizant of the story you want to tell, but also of the audience. So this is really time to thank you, but also to thank the woman who, um, who found you, our student, Sari Scheinfeld, uh, connected with you a few months ago and asked you to participate um, in uh, what is the Holocaust today. We actually have one more uh, lecture uh, on Sunday, June 26 at 4 p.m. We will hear from art historian and provenance researcher Yagnayas Alston, who will speak about Holocaust era plunder and destruction, the provenance research for Jewish That's cultural right. assets. Um, I, I also wanted to recognize the, the work of Seri. Seri is going to be one of the, um, she's about to be one of our first graduates in our master's degree program in the fall of 2022. When we launched the second year of our program, we will already have 40, 40 students in the program. We want to build the next generation, the next cadre of educators and also leaders in the field. And this was perhaps a terrific example for how we can imagine there was a question about what, what, what's the Holocaust tomorrow, not only today. But this was a great example of how important it is to um, identify, identify and, and then train the next generation of our leaders. So Seri, thank you so much for the coordination, design, production, but also for the leadership that you took on, the, on this entire series. I also wanted to thank Hodaya Blau, our coordinator who worked tirelessly on working on the marketing pieces and the coordination of the series. And I, wanted, I also wanted to thank you. Please don't hesitate to email me at shy, S-H-A. I have your address, don't worry. Thank you. That, no, we should definitely you talk. That you I think that YU has an important function in training cadres of teachers that will teach it in a different way. Exactly. Fantastic. And that's why uh, the expert on, you actually coined the term, teaching the Holocaust from the Jewish perspective or the Jewish narrative. That's why um, we, we, we were so privileged and pleased that you had us, in my opinion, as the highlight of the series. So I wanted to now uh, thank you all, send you back to Mother's Day to recognize your mothers, uh, or if you are mothers, to be recognized by your children. Um, and thank you so much. And please, again, shy.pilnik at yu.edu. Feel free to reach out to me if you would like to be on our e-newsletter. And we, will, we are looking forward to seeing you uh, on Sunday, June 26. Thank you also to the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust for being our co-sponsor for this program.